Before we begin today's episode, just a reminder to like, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell if you enjoy this episode. When 22-year-old Jenna Nielsen didn't return home from her job delivering newspapers, her husband became concerned. Eight months pregnant with their third child, he began to worry that she might have gone into labor. Unfortunately, the truth was much more horrifying. 20 miles away in South Raleigh, police had been called to the parking lot of a convenience store. Another newspaper carrier had come upon a disturbing scene. Jenna's car was parked with the door open, dome light on, and engine running. Newspapers were scattered all across the pavement. Moments later, police made a grisly discovery, and as Jenna's husband was calling in to report her missing, investigators came to realize that their victim was the missing mother. A massive investigation was launched to try and track down Jenna and her unborn son Ethan's killer. For more than 13 years, both police and her family have sought justice, but it has remained elusive. Who killed Jenna and Ethan Nielsen? Could it have been someone she knew, or was the 22-year-old randomly targeted? This is Trace Evidence, Episode 142, The Murder of Jenna and Ethan Nielsen. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today we examine a truly horrifying double homicide of a mother and her unborn child. Before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. You can follow the show on social media on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence. The show is also available on MeWe and Minds. If you're interested in supporting the show and getting some Trace Evidence merch, there's a Patreon available at patreon.com slash traceevidence, or you can donate via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions directly through the website or email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. Two quick notes. I'll be taking off next week for the holidays, so this will be the last episode of Trace Evidence for 2020. Episode 143 will release on Tuesday, January 5th. Also, please stick around at the end of the episode for a breaking news update regarding a case previously featured on Trace Evidence. Jenna Nielsen loved being a mother to her two boys and was incredibly excited about the upcoming birth of her third son, Ethan. Tragically, Jenna and Ethan's lives would be stolen by an unknown killer just weeks before her expected due date. This is episode 142, The Murder of Jenna and Ethan Nielsen. For most people, their workday begins with the sun. From those who rise with the dark horizon to walk out into the early orange glow, to those who wake well after the sky has already chosen its particular shade of blue. The vast majority of people begin their workday between the hours of 6 and 10 a.m., rolling their cars onto jammed interstates and crowded streets as everyone begins the morning rush. For approximately 25% of the population, though, their day begins in darkness. While most of their friends and neighbors are tucked comfortably into bed, they step out onto the same sidewalks, drive along the same roads, and yet the differences are palpable. Driving onto mostly empty streets painted by the artificial glow of convenience store lighting and gas station prices. Merging onto vacant interstates with the occasional blink of headlights in the distance. That's how most days began for 22-year-old Jennifer Nielsen, rising early to begin her route as a USA Today paper carrier. She'd pull into empty parking lots, pull the coins from drop boxes, and replace what few copies of the previous edition lingered behind with fresh prints of the current day's news. It wasn't a dream job by far, 
but it did allow Jennifer to make it home in time to see her husband off for his day, and after, she'd get to spend the rest of her morning and afternoon with her two sons. She'd be taking some time off soon. At eight months pregnant, she was just a few weeks away from the birth of their third child, a boy, who would be named Ethan. Unfortunately, on the morning of June 14th, 2007, something would go terribly wrong, and Jennifer wouldn't make it home. It was nearing 5 a.m. when a carrier for Raleigh's regional paper, the News and Observer, pulled into the parking lot at the intersection of Lake Wheeler Road and Centennial Parkway, one of his daily stops. The small, oval-shaped lot was home to an American Food Mart and Exxon gas station, as well as a Subway restaurant attached to the back of the building. The area was typically dark at that time. The mart didn't open for another hour and a half, so there was little but the dim flickering bulbs above the gas pumps. On this morning, though, something was off. Sitting silent in the lot was a lone vehicle, a Honda Civic with its door open and dome lights spilling across the dark pavement. As the carrier approached, assuming maybe the driver was nearby and needed help, the dim glow of the vehicle cast its light across several USA Today newspapers scattered on the ground. Realizing something was very wrong, the man dialed 911 and within minutes, a Raleigh patrolman arrived. After looking over the vehicle, the officer turned his attention to the building, shining his flashlight into the darkness to look for any signs of the driver. Making his way around the structure, the officer looked for any sign of life, but instead would discover a grisly scene. Behind the building, not far from the drive through window, was a motionless body. Even in the early morning darkness, two things were clear. She was pregnant, and she was dead. Across town, her family was already worried. Jennifer was running late, later than she ever did, and so their first thoughts were obvious ones. Maybe, at eight months pregnant, she'd gone into labor and had to go to the hospital. After a series of phone calls to local medical facilities showed that was not the case, the initial worry began transforming into fear. As Jennifer's husband, brother, and father prepared to go out looking for her, a Raleigh police vehicle pulled into the driveway of the couple's apartment. It was clear by the look on the officer's face that something terrible had happened and Jennifer wouldn't be coming home. Jennifer Kathleen Blaine was born in Glendale, California on March 6, 1985 to parents Loran and Kevin. Jenna would go on to have three siblings, two brothers, Jason and Chris, and one sister, Charlie. From an early age, Jenna, as her family called her, showed a talent for performing arts, specifically when it came to dance, singing, and piano. Even as a youngster, Jenna had a direction and drive, as her grandmother, Diane Frank, told the News and Observer. At just seven years old, she dropped out of ballet classes because while she had come to learn and perform, many of the other children seemed content to just play around and laugh. Jenna and her family would ultimately arrive in Utah, where she would live the majority of her life. Not one to submit to distraction, Jenna remained focused on her love of the arts and would attend a performing arts charter school outside of St. George, where she performed ballet, tap, and modern dance. While the teen considered a career in either dancing or modeling, her grandmother explained to the News and Observer that, at just 5 feet 1 inch tall, she was limited in those opportunities. Jenna has been described by everyone in her life as extremely loving and outgoing. As her father explained to North Carolina Wanted, quote, Whenever she walked into the room, people knew she was there. She loved to give hugs and kisses out to everybody. She was just everybody's friend. She was a lot of fun. End quote. As a junior in high school, Jenna had no way of knowing that a typical trip to the mall with a friend would forever change her life. That's where she saw Timothy Nielsen for the first time, and according to her friend, it was love at first sight. While at first Jenna didn't approach, the two eventually found their way together, and within a year they were married when Jenna was 18. Jenna eventually dropped out of high school, though she would go on to earn her GED. About a year into the marriage, 
Jenna gave birth to their first son, and he became the focal point of her life. She stayed home, raising her son, while Tim picked up a factory job, working at the same place as her father. That job would eventually lead them from Utah to North Carolina when the company moved operations out east to Lillington, a city in what's called the Triangle, being made up predominantly of Raleigh, Durham, and Cary. Jenna did not go along at first as she was pregnant with the couple's second child. Tim and her father, Kevin, arrived in North Carolina in the summer of 2006, and Jenna followed that August, along with her two brothers and her stepmother, Stacy, her parents having separated years prior. As her brother Jason explained to the News and Observer, they were a close family and didn't want to be separated, saying, quote, We thought that would be better than living across the country away from one another. End quote. Jenna and Tim settled into a two bedroom apartment in Fuquay, Verena, a small town in southern Wake County, 30 minutes south of Raleigh. According to friends and family, Jenna fell in love with the area and thought it would be a fantastic place to raise their two children, although that number was set to increase by one, as in the winter of 2006, Jenna became pregnant with her third child. Financially, things were stretched a bit, and Jenna found herself wanting to contribute. She began looking for jobs, but there was a problem. The couple couldn't afford to pay for daycare, so she'd have to find employment during times when Tim wasn't at work. According to her brother Jason, he had recently picked up a job with a local newspaper and told her to apply. It wasn't the greatest job, delivering newspapers, but at that point, Jenna was just looking for something to do to help out. She officially took on the job in February of 2007, working from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m., according to the News and Observer. After a few months passed, Jenna was able to pick up work as a carrier for USA Today. She would pick up papers for the day and then head out to paper boxes along her route, emptying the change and swapping old papers out for the new. Because she was working with newspapers, the job required very early mornings, with her normal wake-up time being approximately 3 a.m., but it also allowed her to get in a few hours of work before heading home to take care of the kids. Jenna, an active parent, didn't like the idea of her sons being home in the apartment all day and so she frequently took them to the park where they could run and play. Jenna's family meant everything to her, and her children were her life. She wanted to be able to help build a strong future for them, and to ensure the family was financially equipped to handle the arrival of their coming son, who they decided to name Ethan. By June of 2007, Jenna was 22 years old and 8 months pregnant, due to give birth the next month, on July 8th. Jenna was still working hard, determined to keep delivering papers until July. As her brother Jason explained, quote, she was nonstop. She had a lot of energy for a further along pregnant woman, end quote. According to the official timeline, Jenna awoke at approximately 3 a.m. and began preparing for her day. She left home in her Honda Civic at 3.30 and began the 20-minute drive towards South Raleigh where she would pick up that day's bundles of newspapers. One of her early stops would take her to the dark, empty parking lot of the American Food Mart across from a farmer's market at the intersection of Lake Wheeler Road and Centennial Boulevard. A little before 5 a.m., another carrier arrived to drop off his newspapers when he found Jenna's abandoned car, dome light on, door partially open, engine running, and newspapers scattered on the ground. He contacted police about the situation, and an officer arrived shortly thereafter, at approximately 5 a.m. Jenna's vehicle was sitting in the front half of the parking lot, not far from the entrance to the food mart. Upon looking inside, the officer noted that her purse was in the car, and there didn't appear to be any signs of a struggle within the vehicle. Just minutes into searching the property, that officer discovered Jenna's body, lying behind the building, not far from the drive through window of the Subway restaurant. Less than 10 minutes later, the parking lot was flooded with police vehicles while the scene was being taped off. Around the time police were arriving on the scene, Tim Nielsen was calling in to report his wife missing. Having checked hospitals and with family, 
No one had seen Jenna that morning, and it was highly unusual for her to be home late. Tim notified Jenna's father and brothers, and while all of them were preparing to go out looking for her or her car, officers arrived to break the terrible news to Tim. For the family, it was absolutely devastating and Kevin received the call no father ever wants to get. As he explained to CBS News, quote, I get a call from my son-in-law that says, come to the house as fast as you can. I'll tell you when you get here. Of course, when you pull up, there's a police car in the driveway, two guys in suits. Your heart just drops, end quote. If all had gone according to schedule that morning, Jenna likely would have arrived at the convenience store sometime between 4 and 4.30 a.m., which suggested to investigators that the murder had likely taken place within 30 to 45 minutes of the 911 call. Initially, police didn't reveal many details about the crime to the public, explaining only that a pregnant woman had been killed, but the method and any other information they may have learned was kept confidential. At the time, they were trying to locate the suspect, or anyone who may have seen anything that morning. It was a long shot considering the time of day in the isolated location. Canvassing the area, police spoke with people who lived nearby, those who frequented the gas station, and anyone who came by that morning. Through the wooded area behind the parking lot exists a stretch of railroad tracks, and nearby, there is a community of homeless people. Utilizing a helicopter to help spot encampments, Police went down through the wooded area to question and interview anyone they could find who may have seen or heard anything that morning. At approximately 6.30 a.m., the American manager's wife arrived to open the business, but was stopped by police who explained that the business would remain shut until their investigation had been completed. Less than an hour later, her husband arrived and quickly entered the store to give police tapes from the surveillance cameras the store used. Unfortunately, the cameras only covered the interior of the store and the area near the pumps. However, the tapes did reportedly show a truck with a trailer entering the lot at 2.20 a.m. before pulling off minutes later. And while police didn't seem to think it was connected to the homicide, the driver may have seen someone in the area that morning. The surveillance tapes, while not showing Jenna or her killer, did reveal some of what happened that morning. In discussion with the Columbia Journalism Review, Kevin revealed that shadows were captured moving on the tape. He explained, quote, The only thing caught was the shadow of her coming up to her car, and then another shadow coming up from behind her, then nothing. End quote. During interviews, Police did manage to locate someone who may have seen the killer in the pre-dawn hours. The witness got a good enough look to give police a detailed description, which was ultimately turned into a composite sketch. I should note, though, later police pulled back on the composite, saying that they didn't want it to limit people's minds in terms of the possible killer. According to the witness, the man seen in the area of the parking lot that morning was described as being a young, possibly Hispanic male, between the ages of 17 and 20, standing 5 feet 3 inches tall and weighing 120 pounds, with long, shiny black hair tied in a ponytail which came down to the middle of his back. The man was wearing a black sleeveless shirt, baggy blue jean shorts with no belt. The witness stated that the man was very skinny, with pronounced abdominal muscles, a slender face with no facial hair and light skin. This description intrigued investigators more when, the following morning, at approximately 1.30 a.m. on Friday the 15th, a Spanish-speaking male contacted Raleigh police and informed them that he had information about the murder. However, before police could ask any questions, the man hung up, not revealing any details. The call was tracked to a payphone, and while police dusted for prints and canvassed the area, they were never able to recover anything which might lead to the caller's identity. Whether this was a witness, a prank, or perhaps the killer himself, no one can say for sure. Police were working to try and determine the killer's motive. It seemed apparent from the get-go that it couldn't have been robbery, as the assailant not only left behind Jenna's car, 
but also her purse. In addition to that, Jenna wasn't carrying much, if any, cash on her that morning, and likely the only money present would have been less than $10 worth of quarters, which had been removed from previous newspaper boxes along her route. When asked by investigators, the family agreed that Jenna had never complained about any concerns or fears regarding her job. There was no history of anyone harassing her or any encounters which made her frightful. Early on, there were rumors that the motive may in fact have been related to sexual assault. This came as a result of information that, in addition to the newspapers scattered near Jenna's car, some clothing was also found. As Kevin later told CJR, quote, The police tell us they found articles of clothing and everything else spread out all over the parking lot. She fought her way as much as she could. Then they dragged her behind the building, and that's where it happened. End quote. Police eventually revealed the cause of death as being stabbing, and the autopsy report released several weeks after the crime went into further detail. According to that report, Jenna received a single stab wound one inch in length to the left side of her neck. The blade penetrated inward 3.7 inches, severing both her carotid artery and internal jugular vein. Additional wounds described a cut on her left ear, likely delivered by the murder weapon, as well as abrasions to both elbows, her right knee, and left shin, which the medical examiner suggested could have been due to falling to the ground or perhaps the result of being dragged by the assailant. While the report went on to explain that there were no indications that a sexual assault had taken place, it was revealed that Jenna had been partially disrobed from the waist down, suggesting that perhaps the murder had occurred as Jenna tried to fight off a sexual assault. While admitting that the report didn't exactly give them comfort, Both Tim and Kevin acknowledged that knowing Jenna had not been sexually assaulted did relieve some of the concerns they had. Heartbreakingly, the autopsy report also detailed that Ethan was 39 to 40 weeks old, weighed 6.5 pounds, and was 19.9 inches long. He was completely healthy and developing normally, and had Jenna not been killed, would have been born less than a month later. According to a report from WRAL, a local news station, police were contacted by a resident of The Healing Place, a substance abuse program, who stated that on the morning of the murder, he discovered a bloody knife lying alongside Lake Wheeler Road, not far from the scene of the crime. While police have never confirmed their receipt of the knife or if it was the murder weapon itself, A woman told WRAL that she helped investigators retrieve the blade which the aforementioned man had thrown over a fence after finding it. Another detail which investigators did not reveal until well after the crime was that they had recovered DNA they believe belonged to the killer. While they've never said in what form they collected the DNA, they have made it clear that this is likely a case in which DNA is going to play a pivotal role. The autopsy report, I should note, specified that they had recovered a single hair from Jenna's right hand, which may belong to the killer. Unfortunately, as far as been publicly acknowledged, the DNA has not matched anyone who is in the system. Detective Zeke Morse of the Raleigh Police Department, who began working the case that very morning, discussed the case with CBS 17 and explained that it was solvable but they needed witnesses to come forward, saying, quote, I believe that everybody has a piece of this puzzle. It's just a matter of putting it all together. And I believe there's some people out there, or someone out there, who has that piece of the puzzle that we're missing right now. End quote. He went on to note that advances in DNA technology could help break this case open. Following the murder, Jenna's family had her remains brought back to Utah where she would be buried in Redwood Memorial Cemetery. Her stone, which is inscribed with the dates of her birth and death, also mark Ethan's death beneath a banner reading, Together Forever. During the funeral, back in Raleigh, police were utilizing a hotline set up specifically for tips about the case. Thanks to wide media coverage early on, they received hundreds of tips in the first weeks, though they admitted none of them led to a breakthrough. 
near the end of the month, Jenna's brothers and father gathered in a local park to announce a $10,000 reward for information leading to an arrest. Kevin hoped that the killer could be found before having the chance to strike again, destroying another family. During the announcement for the reward, Kevin also revealed plans to work with legislators to help change North Carolina legislation. At the time in North Carolina, there was no law on the books which made the murder of a pregnant woman a double homicide, making it one of 14 states with no fetal homicide law. In fact, had police managed to track down and arrest the killer, he could only have been charged with Jenna's murder. As Kevin explained to the media, quote, an unborn child should be recognized if the mother's killed. Right now, they recognize my daughter's murder but they don't recognize my unborn grandson's murder. End quote. On June 30th, just over two weeks after the crime, friends, family, and volunteers fanned out across the state, posting flyers bearing both Jenna's picture as well as the composite sketch. This would become a weekly ritual, with everyone putting up flyers and trying to draw attention to the case. The family also started a website, justiceforjenna.org, which compiled details about the case as well as showing the composite sketch and providing links through which people could submit tips. At the time, it was also acknowledged that the family was working to get coverage of Jenna's case on various news and television programs, such as America's Most Wanted. On July 9th, the family held a candlelight vigil to mark not only the loss of Jenna's life, but that of her unborn son, Ethan, who was due to be born that week. A little over a week later, a local band, Pivot, held a benefit concert to raise money for both the family and the investigation. In August, America's Most Wanted ran a segment discussing Jenna's case and showing the composite sketch. Within minutes, their call center was flooded with reports of a rape suspect in Mississippi. The suspect, known as the babyface rapist due to victims' descriptions of his features, was apprehended by Ocean Springs police and identified as Jess Green. Green had confessed to two sexual assaults, both of which had taken place near a local Walmart. Both attacks took place within two weeks of Jenna's murder, and Green's appearance was so close to the composite that Raleigh police flew to Mississippi to question him in person. It was during this time that authorities learned Green had in fact been in the state of North Carolina during the week that Jenna was killed. All of the information seemed to line up, but there were some issues. Primarily, the suspect description had him standing at 5 feet 3 inches tall, while Green stood 6 feet tall. Beyond that, Green apparently provided an alibi for the time of the murder, which investigators were able to confirm. While it isn't directly discussed in any news article, the possibility that his DNA was tested also exists because he was eventually ruled out. Raleigh police, when speaking to America's Most Wanted, expressed that while they thought they had a good lead, they ultimately managed to simply narrow things down, eliminating Green from their list of potential killers, though Raleigh police would later say that they had never eliminated anyone. For Tim Nielsen, it was incredibly difficult to accept the reality of his loss two months after. When speaking with the News and Observer, Tim explained, quote, It's frustrating not knowing anything. There's a void that will never be filled, and the suspect may not even be in the area anymore. End quote. He went on to express the pain of having to explain things to his young children who couldn't fully understand. His eldest child, three at the time, continued to ask when his mother would be coming home, and seeing Jenna's picture on television would only cause more confusion. Tim had to perform the difficult task of explaining to his son that his mother wouldn't be coming home, and instead was in heaven. Despite early attention, a large volume of tips, and a handful of valuable evidence, investigators were struggling to solve the case. By October of that year, the reward for information was raised to $15,000. And while this caused a temporary uptip in tips, again, none of them were able to deliver police information which could be used to identify a suspect. Tragically, the case began growing cold, 
and as time passed, media coverage began to trail off. For their part, Jenna's family worked to keep her name in the spotlight, appearing on various shows and doing interviews, but it seemed that anyone who might have information was keeping it to themselves, and for police, the absence of any hits on the DNA or the discovery of any similar crimes left them with a wide array of possibilities. A little over a year later, in September of 2008, Tim Nielsen decided to leave North Carolina, going back to Utah with his children. The memories were far too strong and painful to confront, and Tim hoped to go back to school to obtain a degree in criminal justice before moving on to law school. In Utah, his family would be able to help take care of the boys while he pursued those goals. He expressed at the time that, were he able to do so, he would very much want to return to North Carolina with his degree to work with investigators in trying to solve the murder of his wife. Unfortunately, despite the efforts of investigators who noted that the case was still being worked daily, there simply were no new developments, and for a case which has been described as very solvable, it seemed the timeline was not going to be a quick one. In February of 2009, Jenna's case was featured on the WRAL program North Carolina Wanted. Kevin took part in an interview for the program, as did Major Ken Mathias of the Raleigh Police Department. On the show, it was announced that while police believed the crime itself could have been random, they had not yet ruled out the possibility that Jenna could have known her killer. Major Mathias explained, quote, we are still working on the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of leads, and I'm confident that we will clear this case. End quote. Tim was also interviewed for the show and expressed his frustration that, until the killer was caught, he would always wonder why this happened, who was responsible, and what the police were doing to find those answers. It was also mentioned that police had asked the media to stop sharing the composite sketch as they worried it would cause people not to call in tips if their suspect didn't fit that description. Two long years passed, and then in April of 2011, Jenna's family's fight for recognition of Ethan's murder resulted in the passing of House Bill 215, known as Ethan's Law. The Unborn Victims of Violence Act recognized an unborn child as a second victim when the child is injured or dies during the commission of a crime. When interviewed about the law, Tim told KSL Utah News, quote, Something good definitely came out of my wife getting killed. It's a good thing that not only is she recognized in this law, but my son is recognized in this law. With North Carolina not having a fetal homicide law at the time this happened, I do feel like Ethan was overlooked. End quote. The article noted that at the time, Tim was attending Weber State University in pursuit of a degree in criminal justice while also going through the police academy. Sadly, time continued moving forward, and while Jenna's family has never given up on finding justice for her, the case itself has failed to evolve. For the most part, following the passing of Ethan's Law, news coverage becomes extremely rare. A few articles scattered over the years recount the known details of the case, and while interviews with investigators continue to stir up hope that the case can be solved, there have been few results. The next time the case experienced major media coverage was in June of 2017, 10 years after Jenna and Ethan's murder. CBS 17 sat down with Kevin to interview him a decade after his daughter, and unborn grandson were killed. It was clear from the conversation that while Kevin continues to fight for justice, it's been extremely difficult to accept how much time has passed without a resolution. Kevin explained, quote, I was hoping it would be solved quickly, I think like anyone else. But as the years have drugged by, still nothing. They searched high and low, found a lot of clues, but nothing has led to anyone. I hold out hope, sure, I'm never going to give up. After 10 years, you start to wonder. There's no closure. There's always going to be a hole. I mean, you have that part of your life that's taken away, 
You can't replace that. You can move on and deal with it, but there's always going to be that hole. End quote. It's been 13 years since Jenna Nielsen and her unborn son Ethan were brutally murdered in South Raleigh in the early morning hours of June 14, 2007. All these years later, and still the case remains both unsolved and without a named or identified suspect. Police maintain that they're still working the case, and Detective Zeke Morse, who has been working it since day one, continues to believe that they will eventually solve it. To this day, there are no answers about the killer, and many are left wondering if it was truly a random crime, or if the killer knew Jenna, or perhaps knew her routine and planned his attack for that morning. Jenna's two sons, now in their teens, have had to grow up knowing their mother mostly through the stories they're told by family. If alive today, Jenna would be 35 years old and Ethan would be 13. But all of that was stolen by a violent killer in a matter of minutes. Yet while the family has been left to suffer with the questions that haunt them, the killer has remained free, perhaps to strike again. It's a devastating crime which destroyed a family, robbing them of a sister, wife, daughter, and mother, as well as a son, grandson, nephew, and brother. On the family site, justiceforjenna.org, the following was posted just this year. Jenna and Ethan, it's hard to believe that it's been 13 years since someone selfishly stole you from our family. There isn't a day that goes by that you and Ethan are not in our thoughts. Skylar and Caden are growing so fast. They look like you, act like you, and laugh like you. For that, we are able to see you each and every day through them. Skylar asks about you often and helps Caden remember Mommy. You always brought joy and happiness into our lives. We miss your laughter and especially your bubbly personality. Life will never be the same without you. Please look down upon your boys, watch over them, and take care of them. We love you, and we'll miss you always. A hardworking mother out trying to make money to raise her two sons, with her third on the way, is viciously murdered in a dark parking lot before the sun rises. 22-year-old Jenna Nielsen was a devoted mother, wife, and daughter. She was a talented performer with dreams of someday opening her own dance studio. Her children were her life, and she was keenly focused on being with them, raising them, taking care of them. Yet in a moment of madness, all of that was taken. Both Jenna and Ethan's lives were extinguished by a cold-blooded killer who seemingly disappeared as quickly as he had attacked. Thirteen years later, and the reality of this case is no easier to digest than it was in 2007. How do you come to terms with something like this? How can you even begin to fathom the type of person who would not only attack and attempt to sexually assault a woman who is eight months pregnant, but who would also kill her with complete disregard? before vanishing into the early morning dark. For 13 years, police and Jenna's family have struggled to answer these questions, and despite the passage of time, it has become no easier and likely never will. In the aftermath, a family was shattered by the acts of a brutal killer. Jenna's young sons are now teenagers, her husband still struggles with not knowing the truth, and her family fights to find the killer so that he might pay the price for what he's done, for what he has taken from them. Despite possessing a description in the killer's DNA, police have never been able to identify a suspect, and in the absence of that name, can only expound on the possibilities of a few different theories. To them, everyone is a suspect, and until the day where they find a name, no one is completely cleared of suspicion. For a crime this horrifying and terrible, you think there'd be greater awareness. Jenna's family has worked hard to keep her name in the spotlight, but as the years have moved forward with more and more speed, media coverage has sputtered off, leaving a massive void where there should be greater discussion and analysis. Unfortunately, 
there isn't a lot to analyze, and all purported theories essentially fit into one of two categories. That this was a murder conducted by someone Jenna knew, or it was committed by someone completely unknown to her who either struck at random or planned his attack after noting her newspaper delivery schedule. From the beginning, police theorized the murder was random, at least in the sense of the killer's identity. There didn't appear to be any evidence to suggest anything to the contrary. Jenna was attacked and killed in an empty parking lot that she visited in the early morning hours, delivering copies of the USA Today while retrieving old copies and change spent purchasing them. For many, the debate becomes whether or not the killer just happened to be there that day, a wrong place, wrong time situation, or if it's possible the killer had familiarized himself with Jenna's schedule and planned the crime out in advance. Beginning with the wrong place, wrong time situation, the complete lack of development of a suspect may be the result of the true randomness of the crime. If indeed this is a situation where the killer saw Jenna, and decided to act on the opportunity, it would surely make him more difficult to track down. As we're all aware, random crimes are notoriously hard to crack because the logical analysis that is typically employed during the investigation is based on probabilities, patterns, and likelihoods. When the killer is unknown to the victim, has no solid ties to the community, and strikes in a seemingly random fashion, that can make identification a much more difficult task. If it truly was random, then I can't help but wonder what the killer was doing there that morning. There's no evidence to suggest anyone attempted to break into the convenience store or restaurant, no indication that any other crime was in progress when Jenna pulled into the parking lot. It's not as though she stumbled upon something and the killer decided she couldn't be allowed to escape. All the evidence that's been publicly shared seems to imply that, for some reason unbeknownst to us, there happened to be a man with a knife standing somewhere in the morning darkness. Sticking with the possibility that this was random, we do know that there were several encampments in the woods and along the nearby train track which was home to transient people. If the killer was transient and perhaps stayed at one of these locations or in the nearby area, it's not out of the realm of possibility that he could have come walking out of the woods that morning and was crossing through the parking lot when he saw Jenna's headlights come pulling in. Maybe hiding himself alongside the building, it's possible he could have watched Jenna unload the papers, and when she turned her back to get into the car, he rushed after her. We know the weapon used was a knife, and as someone who lives in North Carolina, I can tell you it's extremely common to see people carrying knives. Oftentimes, they wear them in pouches attached to their belts or pants, so the idea that the killer had a knife doesn't necessarily make me believe that it was entirely related to criminal acts, although in this situation, obviously, that turned out to be the case. It also isn't uncommon for a homeless person to have some kind of a weapon, primarily for protection, as life on the streets can be dangerous. If indeed the killer is transient, That would make tracking him down a lot more difficult, with no home or solid community ties to try and follow. Whether this person was in the area for just a few days, far longer, or might still be in the area is a question that no one possesses the answer to, but which certainly complicates the investigation. We know a witness apparently saw someone who may have been the killer, although there's no direct way to confirm if that was the killer or just someone who happened to be around at that time. I think it's interesting to note that in the description given by the witness, there's nothing stated about the person's clothing appearing old or worn. There's no mention of the man appearing as though he was living on the streets. Instead, his hair was described as shiny and held in a tight, neat ponytail. That doesn't necessarily rule out someone who was living a transient lifestyle, but it's always struck me that nothing about the description leans that way. The location of the American was approximately three-tenths of a mile to the northeast of Interstate 40, and the Walnut Creek Trail ran up from the woods to a parallel position with the parking lot. Approximately seven-tenths of a mile to the east through the woods is US-70, another busy road. Directly across the street is a state farmer's market and a series of other businesses which, while during the day may be busy, in the early morning hours would be deserted. 
Because of the location and time, it both opens possibilities that almost anyone could have committed this crime while simultaneously cutting down on the potential for a large number of witnesses. While we have no way of knowing with any certainty the exact motive of the killer, evidence picked up by investigators and the manner in which Jenna was found seems to suggest that this may have been a sexually driven crime. If that's the case, then it's possible the killer had intended to sexually assault Jenna, but ultimately killed her as she fought with everything she had to protect herself and her unborn child. I suppose for me it becomes a debate. Which is more likely, that the killer happened to see Jenna that morning and decided to strike, or that the killer may have been familiar with her routine and planned out the attack? That's the other side of the coin, that maybe the murder itself wasn't random, although it still could have been committed by someone who didn't know Jenna. If the killer had been in the area, it wouldn't have taken long to note and establish Jenna's routine. She appeared at the American around the same time each morning. There was never anyone else around, and for someone looking to either kill or rape, she may have been viewed as an easy target. Perhaps the fact that she was pregnant could have been seen as a weak point, that the killer could have assumed she'd likely go along quietly in order to protect herself and her child. If we're looking at something that was planned, I don't know that it would require a great amount of research. It could have been as random as the killer seeing Jenna delivering papers on Monday, then again on Tuesday and Wednesday, and the decision was made to strike on Thursday. Seeing a petite woman by herself in the early morning hours when no one else is around might have seemed like easy prey, but the killer was dramatically wrong with that. Jenna was a fighter, and all indications were that she fought tooth and nail until her killer struck the fatal blow. Very quickly, I also want to address the Jess Green connection. Jess Green committed two sexual assaults two weeks after Jenna's murder. Both crimes took place in Mississippi, and both happened near the same Walmart. Seeing a photo of Jess beside the composite drawing is remarkably striking. It's one of the few times I've ever thought someone looked exactly like a composite. It's really uncanny. When you factor in that he was in North Carolina when Jenna was killed, it's difficult to accept that this is a mere coincidence. Of course, there's a problem. From everything we know, Jess is no longer considered a suspect. While police haven't given much about it, there's likely a handful of factors that could lead to the dismissal. Firstly, Green is six feet tall, while the witness described Jenna's potential killer as being around five foot three. Now, if we're talking about a difference of an inch or two, that's more debatable, but a nine inch difference is no small thing. Beyond that, Green went about his crimes in a completely different manner. In both cases for which he confessed, he approached his victims and asked for a ride. Once inside the vehicles, he produced a gun and then proceeded to attack. Neither of his victims were killed, and both were considered abducted prior to the attacks. We also know that police tested Green's DNA, both in relation to the crimes and as found on the gun, and they matched in addition to his confessions, which confirmed it for them. We know in Jenna's case they have DNA, so I find it hard to imagine they wouldn't have performed a test here. Honestly, I feel incredibly frustrated by this entire angle. On paper, Green seems to have it all, but once you begin digging, the bottom drops out. I also find it really hard to swallow that this could just be a coincidence, but based on everything we know, Jess Green does not appear to be the man who killed Jenna Nielsen and Ethan Nielsen. It's really very difficult to accept that the crime was random. Sadly, stranger things have happened, and there's no way to know with any certainty, but I'm inclined to believe at a minimum, someone was aware that Jenna would be in that parking lot that morning and was waiting to strike. This particular scenario has, for some, opened the door to the possibility that the crime could have been committed by someone Jenna did know, maybe someone who already had possessed knowledge of her route, where she typically was and at what times. Police themselves have made it clear they can't rule out this possibility, and so we move into the theory that Jenna could have known her killer. 
We know the police went through both Jenna and Tim's email accounts looking for any possible links to a suspect who could have known and targeted Jenna, though this doesn't appear to have yielded any results. That being said, many believe this crime had to have been committed by someone who knew Jenna and had knowledge of where she would be. The main problem really is the utter lack of evidence in terms of this theory. We know that investigators interviewed more than 1,000 people in relation to this case, and I'd imagine it's safe to assume that included people Jenna knew, both on a personal and professional basis. The only people I could imagine having a fairly concise knowledge of her morning routine would be people she worked with and possibly family members, although whether or not they'd know exact times and places seems a bit far-fetched. Knowing someone delivers newspapers in the morning is one thing, but knowing in what order and what times is something different. Assuming that the composite sketch is accurate, you'd imagine police wouldn't have had great difficulty questioning someone Jenna knew who fits that description. How many of us know men who are 5 feet 3 inches tall with long black ponytails? The only possibility that seems like there's potential to it would be someone Jenna knew who decided to tail her over the course of some mornings to really do their homework and narrow down her routine. We know Jenna took her kids to the park, that she was extremely outgoing and friendly, so it's not entirely impossible that someone she knew, even on a casual basis, could have taken a twisted interest in her. It's surely possible someone could have noted her routine and then arrived at the American early, lying in wait. If indeed the true motive was sexual assault, it wouldn't be difficult to imagine someone could have developed an infatuation. Unfortunately, it's all speculative. Whether you're looking at a random crime, a random crime with a premeditated factor, or someone Jenna knew. Thirteen years later, police don't appear to have closed in on any one particular person, or even a handful of people. At least, not that they've shared. Given that they possess DNA from the killer, you'd imagine they'd have requested samples from anyone they thought could be a possibility, and nowhere could I find any articles that discussed anyone denying a sample, though I also couldn't find any discussions of any samples being collected to begin with. In so many cases, there's a dramatic lack of evidence which makes them seem almost impossible to solve. Here, we've got a witness, a description, and DNA, and yet nothing. No prime suspect, no named person of interest, no anything. Thirteen years later and the killer's identity remains a mystery, one which investigators have said they'll eventually crack, but after all this time, it's difficult to hang on to that belief. Maybe DNA technology will develop to a point where their sample can help, or the killer will find himself in police custody for a different crime, at which time a connection will be made. We've seen cases with far less evidence solved after much longer periods of time, but the frustration comes in when you think about the atrociousness of this crime set against the pain and grief of Jenna's family. Jenna Nielsen was a talented, intelligent, loving and caring mother, daughter, sister and wife. She was elated about the upcoming birth of her son Ethan, and during a time where there should have been excitement and celebration, there was instead grief and mourning. This killer didn't just rob Jenna of her life, but he stole Ethan's life before it could even begin. Now, what remains are memories. Memories which her family treasures, but which also give little peaks of what might have been had Jenna not been killed that early morning in June of 2007. Despite their pain and frustration, the family continues to cling to the hope that the answers are coming, that justice will be served. They manage to utilize that hurt, that anger, that grief, to change the laws of North Carolina and ensure that should something like this happen again, the killer will be held responsible for the theft of two lives instead of just one. We know there's someone out there with the answers, perhaps someone beyond the killer. Remember, Less than 24 hours after the murder, an anonymous caller claimed to have information, but never delivered it. How many people might know the truth? How many witnesses could there be either who saw the killer, or perhaps were told of his exploits? After all this time, through all this pain, hasn't Jenna's family suffered enough? 
Whoever knows the truth holds the key, not only to solving Jenna and Ethan's murders, but also to granting her family some semblance of justice. Something they might be able to find even the slightest shred of comfort in. Unfortunately, unless DNA technology advances, someone calls in with their knowledge, or the killer himself is found, the murder of Jenna and Ethan Nielsen will remain open, unsolved, and growing cold. If you're looking for more information about the murder of Jenna and Ethan Nielsen, there are a lot of articles available online. Both the News and Observer and WRAL did extensive coverage of this case. You can also visit the family's webpage at justiceforjenna.org. That's justice, the number four, jenna.org. If you have any information about the murder of Jenna and Ethan Nielsen, please contact Raleigh Crime Stoppers at 919-834-4357. You can be completely anonymous in delivering your information. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, message me on Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or comment in the Facebook group. Now for a special case update. In episode 30 of Trace Evidence, we examine the mysterious disappearance of 24-year-old Unique Harris. The single mother of two put her children to bed on October 9, 2010, and when they awoke the next morning, she was gone. At first, it was thought Unique may have gone to the store or to visit a neighbor, but when her family found her eyeglasses in the apartment, they knew something was wrong. Unique could barely see without them and would never leave them behind. The case was absolutely baffling to most who examined it, unsure of who could have been involved. As the years moved on, it began to seem as though the truth would forever escape us, but thankfully, all of that has changed as of this past Monday, December 21st. D.C. Metropolitan Police officially arrested and charged 43-year-old Isaac Moy with second-degree murder while armed in the case of Unique Harris. According to the arrest warrant as obtained by People magazine, an anonymous informant who had served time in prison with Moy told authorities that the 43-year-old had explained his connection to a missing persons case and bragged that he wouldn't be caught because, quote, he did it the right way so they'll never figure it out, end quote. Reportedly, Police found DNA evidence on Unique's couch, which matched Moy. Furthermore, Moy was wearing a GPS tracker at the time of Unique's disappearance, and the data for the evening of October 9th shows that he was present in Unique's apartment complex that night. According to police, Moy has faced previous arrests for assault with a dangerous weapon, simple assault, and distribution of narcotics. On Monday morning, Moy entered a plea of not guilty in D.C. Superior Court. Unique's mother, Valencia, upon release of the news, issued a short statement on Facebook, saying in part, quote, I hope and pray every parent out here can rest a little easier. My child's life and passing will not be in vain. End quote. Moy is set to return to court on Monday, January 11th. Obviously, this is a very new development and not all information has been disclosed, but this is certainly something I'll be keeping an eye on, and when it's all said and done, I'll issue a full update episode. In the meantime, should anyone have any information about the disappearance of Unique Harris, her connection to Isaac Moy, or his alleged involvement in her case, please contact the D.C. Police at 202 727 9099 or text an anonymous tip to 50411. Did you know that CrimeCon is coming to the United Kingdom and will be in London on June 12th and 13th, 2021? And I'll be there representing Trace Evidence on Podcast Row. I'm really looking forward to being a part of this amazing event. And if you're considering going, 
you can use the promo code TRACE21 for 10% off your ticket. That's TRACE21 for 10% off. Visit crimecon.co.uk for more information. Trace evidence would not be possible without the amazing support of you incredible listeners. So I'd like to take a moment to thank our amazing Patreon producers. Special thanks to Alicia Lorraine, Anne Bertram, Astrid Nyer, Brittany Bivens, Brian Kemmerling, Christine Greco, Krista Colvin, Dearthy, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, Jennifer Winkler, Joni Berkwitz, Kevin Bonham, Michael Draves, Nick Mohar Schurz, Pamela Coburn, Quinn McBreen, Roberta Jansen, Sarah, Sarah Mascaratolo, Travis Skepko, Stephanie Eve, Tom Archer, Tom Radford, and Tracy Woods. You're all amazing and your contributions are greatly appreciated, as are all patrons. If you're interested in supporting Trace Evidence, please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence or visit trace-evidence.com for further information. That concludes this episode and wraps up Trace Evidence for 2020. Over the course of the past year, we've dug into some truly haunting cases, and through it all, you've been there, sending emails with your theories, leaving comments with your case suggestions. I just wanted to thank all of you for listening to the show, for being active in the discussions, and for helping spread the word about so many unsolved cases. Without you, there is no trace evidence, and for your dedication and engagement, I'm eternally grateful. So I want to wish you the happiest of holidays and a brilliant new year. I know we're all looking forward to leaving 2020 behind us. So here's to 2021 and hopefully the resolution to many more unsolved cases. Trace Evidence will return on Tuesday, January 5th. So I hope you'll join me then for another unsolved case.